Good afternoon, Michael, and welcome, David, to the Surf Our Surfs Up series. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for asking me. Um, so to kick off our episode, we'll um, let you do a little bit of an introduction into what's your name and what's your role. Um, if you want to just take it, take it away. Easy questions first. <laughs> um, so. I'm David Ransom. Um, I'm a director at Zone Planning Group. We're based at Burley Heads, uh, but we have uh, offices in uh, Gladstone, which we were just talking about, and also down in the Southern Highlands at South Wales as well. We do town planning work uh, basically throughout Queensland and New South Wales, occasionally elsewhere. Yeah. When um, did you start zone planning? How did you um, to found it? Uh, well, it been, uh, I guess originally I worked in local government, lots of uh, town planners sort of staying in local government, great place to um, get the lie of the land and understand who does what in the development industry. Uh, and then I uh, went out into uh, private consulting in 2001, and uh, not with Zone, that happened quite a bit later, that happened in uh, 2016, uh, where I just connected with some like-minded uh, guys that I went to uni with uh, a long time ago. And we found ourselves in similar situations. Sort of to do uh, that, to kick it off there. What was your local governments? What? Gold Coast City Council. Just Gold Coast City Council. Yeah, and, and in the UK, it's Sydney as well. Quick. Yeah. Cool. Uh, how did you end up on the coast? Um, I guess I came back from overseas and had to decide where I would live. And uh, originally from Sydney and concluded pretty quickly that... Uh, it's just uh, completely unaffordable down there and it's going to be, if I wanted to live anywhere uh, nice in Sydney, that would be almost impossible really? at that stage of my life. So I decided that um, there's be better prospects for the future. Mm. In, your ro- in your role at Zone, what does a day-to-day look like for you when you get into work? Uh, well, you can sit down at the beginning of the day and write a list of uh, things that you would like to achieve that particular day and then when you end up going home um, at 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock, whatever the time is, often none of those things are done because uh, the way it works in our industry is um, things pop up randomly, urgently, that need attention and you're constantly dealing with those sorts of things. So... I guess um, what we've tried to do is get a team that deal with those, are shielded from that to some extent, so they deal with the predictable stuff that means doing that we can schedule in. And uh, my job um, and, and the job of the other directors is to deal with all the other stuff that randomly comes up that needs dealing with immediately that you had absolutely no idea would happen when you first sat down in the morning. What are some of the examples without getting, getting particular? So what's the examples of a, you know, a bushfire? Um, Oh, okay. It might be that, um, like, you've lodged a development application with council, for example, and out of the blue, something that's um, completely left field comes along, which you have to have to deal with. Um, I've just been involved in a meeting before I came here where negotiating with a, the electricity authority and uh, bulk water authority about an easement, uh, for example, um, and things came out of that meeting that um, I didn't envisage would come out of that meeting. Uh, that you then need to move on and deal with. So, um, no, it's just never a dull moment. That's what's good about the job. It's, um, uh, you know, if, if it was really um, boring and predictable, it might not be as, uh, you know, something I would be that interested in, but it's not. You know, there's always something different, you and dynamic happening pretty much every day. Is there a reoccurring thing that com- comes up which gives you the craps in terms of, you know, something that should have been addressed by the local governments or is there something that annoys you that uh, why, why am I still seeing this as an issue? I think we in this country have um, really over-regulated development and that annoys me. Um, there are many occasions where I see things that could be done simply and streamlined and uh, yet they're not. And um, you know, wondering why we assign all these resources uh, to to things that 
Um, really, it's just wheel spin at the end of the day. Um, yeah, particularly, you know, our, our role is to gain permission for people who want to actually build things to, you know, further our economy and our society. A lot of these things are very, very sensible things to do and it just annoys me when there's roadblocks put in place for no, no reason, um, I guess. But that, that's a pretty high level answer. Yeah, it was, I, know, I didn't want to. You want to tack you into it, you know, something which was going to be difficult. But yeah, it's, it always seems to me that it's a, it's a, uh, the challenge would be to continually, gen- some on some days face the same sorts of stuff that would drive me a little bit batty. That we can why why still why is this still an issue in twenty twenty four, particularly when we've got housing shortages and everything like that. But yeah, the word is, you know, we got to do development differently, but. Ugh. Potentially, it still seems to be the same issues popping up all the time. It seems like there's a long lead time between, you know, um, just the, the leaders actually understanding a particular issue and that really filtering down into bureaucracies, everybody getting on board um, with, with uh, you know, aligning their objectives. So um, at the end of the day, housing crisis, I think, um, the two things that will drive it home will be um, government setting targets that are are never achieved that are measurable and people start to go well why is that Um, and uh, the size of your local homeless camp basically that you get to see every day and you wonder why is that happening Um, they're two things off the top of my head that I think will ultimately you know put this at the forefront of people's typical Aussies typical Aussies about a you know one minute to midnight crisis yeah. To uh, to move move things sometimes, but yeah, I guess um, pe- people, you know, to some extent, appreciate what they can see themselves. Um, you know, some, sometimes these things are pretty complicated to understand if you're not, not involved in that world. Um, for issues, um, particularly to do with the Gold Coast. Zone Planning publishes reports on its website, which we've spoken about. What are the purpose of the reports? Um, yeah, we I guess we try to not just uh, lodge development applications uh, with various councils. We, we try to um, influence policy and get active um, in relation to um, draft policy, which happens all the time. Um, because, you know, I think we believe that you can't really um, complain about new rules that were introduced if you didn't bother to uh, try and, you know, point them in a particular direction or get involved in the consultation process. So probably the two things you were talking about are two dwelling supply reports we did on the, on the Gold Coast. Um, and what prompted us to do that is, um, I guess we were constantly hearing from... Um, Queensland government in particular that there's plenty of greenfield land in South East Queensland and Gold Coast City and that just wasn't aligning with our experience at all and the experience of our clients. Um, we were constantly getting um, phone calls from people saying, you know, can you find us a townhouse site in the city or I'd like to do a subdivision um, in, in the city and uh, you just have to say, look, I'm sorry, there's just no land available you know i don't know where those sites are um um you know our experience was that that land just wasn't there and um i guess to to try and find out what the facts were ourselves we actually did the first study which was a stock take of all greenfield land in the city where we actually went through site by site and actually counted it all and then uh, produced a report that said here are the facts um and they're Pretty undisputable, really. The only grey area in those reports is um, in relation to um, economics and um, what can be developed on land depending on what the economy is like at any particular time. But the bottom line was there's no grant for land and that's still the case. Um, but obviously, I think we're in this city we've reached the point where um, we've hit the edges and that's it. There's no more. Um, so, um, yeah, we need to... Um, deal with that so I mean to coming back again and coming back within the, the footprint um yeah it means a couple of things um one is um like hunt out the last bits of land that are 
outside the southeast Queensland urban footprint, which is effectively like a and drawbridge, um, which you can't cross if you want to do urban development. But there is land outside the urban footprint that could be um, urbanised without compromising environmental values or, or actual hazard issues. Um, that's one thing to do. The other thing is to look back at, at our suburban locations and see how we can intensify those. Uh, and the other thing is just accept that a lot of people, for affordability reasons, are going to be living in Bow Desert and um, you know, you're going to have to build a lot better transport infrastructure to get people safely to and from those places. I haven't looked at the Gold Coast particularly, but I remember looking at a sort of heat map of Brisbane mm. and sort of down the sort of inner circle, then the sort of five kilometre radius circle or 10 kilometre radius circle. And the, the density difference between, say, an old suburb like Holland Park. And, you know, the, the inner city, it is just so remarkable, it was only a few kilometres away. Mm, mm. Is, that, is that potentially something of the same thing here? Is it, is it that it can be a conversation that some of the older suburbs are going to have to consider or be part of a conversation about becoming more dense? Yeah. I mean, the difference with the Gold Coast is the old bits aren't that old, um, unless you're talking about the middle of... Southport or yeah. Burley Heads or Corn Gatta, because they were the original yeah. townships. Uh, the rest of it is not particularly old, um, so it's a little bit different to other uh, larger yeah. cities. Yeah. Um, so, at, absolutely, uh, you know, and, and traditionally we uh, don't protect a lot of stuff in terms of heritage controls here. I think if you go to the Gold Coast Planning Scheme and see what's heritage protected, there might be one page worth of things. Uh, maybe there's 10 or 12 things on there, I can't remember. Whereas um, if you go to Brisbane, um, I think it's the case that anything um, pre-1946, you can't touch it. And, Is that um, not the case on the coast? No, not at all. Um, we, it's never been a big issue in the city. This has always been a city where um, we accept that redevelopment occurs and growth occurs and population growth occurs. So, um, you know, the... Maybe maybe the needle's not in exactly the right position here, but um, now it's a progressive city where things move ahead. Mm-hmm. If we go back to Greenville for a second, and um, how come in your reports it said that um, a lot of the uh, that land is not able to be developed due to flooding? Of feas- economic feasibility, um, a, a bunch of reasons. Is that land still recognised by the government as being able to be developed? But in your report, you found it wasn't. How come yeah. that the, the two haven't been married together? What I guess our report um, highlighted, which everyone in in the development industry pretty much knows about, is that you can't trust the zones. So um, the best example that's used endlessly is there's a great big block of land at Uelpa Road in uh, Pimpermart, and it's in the medium density residential zone, great big block of land. And uh, I reckon every town planner in the city's fielded a phone call from someone in Melbourne or Sydney who said, hey, I've got this block of land under contract. Um, Want to come and see you about putting some townhouses or some cut it up into housing? And, uh, and usually I imagine the response is, oh, that block of land, we know that one. Just don't even worry about it. Um, walk away now um, because it has overlays applicable to it, environmental overlays and flood overlay mapping, meaning that you can basically do nothing with the property. So um, there's a bit of a uh, falsehood to planning instruments that place land in uh, land use zones that, 99.9% of society that's not involved in our industry would go, well, that means you can develop it, when in fact you actually can't. So what our report did was actually drill into all of that and remove the land and had those types of constraints that would preclude the development occurring. For, for a prat- what the real number was. From a practical perspective, these are out of... You've, you've said these are, shouldn't be considered, but but the, but the government is just looking at it from a more... Well, it can be, but there's... 
subject to A, B, C, D, E, F and G. We can't just measure the zoned land and say that means we've got enough land for X amount of dwellings. Mm. You've actually got to strip out all the other constraints that prevent you developing it. So if you've got land with um, all koala habitat on it, you can't develop it um, and neither should you. Um, and land that's uh, flood affected in a, in a significant way or subject to, you know, it's on the you know, west facing slope in a, at, the, at the top of a hill that's got a bushfire hazard, then that should be discounted as well. So what our reports did was really through um, consulting with environmental experts to extract all of that and say, let's assume that can't be developed. Here's what the real number is. Mm. It's a lot less than what the official number is. Has the Gold Coast lighting map changed in recent times? Does it, does it get re- it reviewed? Um, in 2018, I think it got reviewed. Um, so um, from time to time, flood mapping gets amended and typically it goes up. Um, there's a more and more conservative attitude around uh, flooding um, where you know, I think uh, particularly local government um, is concerned about uh, facilitating development in areas where there is going to be uh, flooding occurring. Most of the city is on a floodplain. Mm. Like if you apply Ability. today's rules to Gold Coast City, then you conclude that we built the city in the wrong spot. Um, but here it is. Uh, so it, it is a constraint that we have to work with, but um, it's not that common that it completely knocks development out of the park. It's, there's various engineering ways you can sort of you know, work around that sort of stuff. It's a little bit different in greenfield areas, however, because usually the flood affected land coincides with the um, core environmental attributes, meaning that um, even if you could engineer the flooding issue out, the vegetation can't be removed anyway, so there's no point uh, pursuing it. Does insurance, affordability of insurance come into play here when it comes to insurance companies looking to adjust their premiums every time there's an adjustment at the margins when it comes to the flood? I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, it's um, it's a bit of a black art, um, all of that. Um, I, but what I do know, I guess, is that there's in, in inherent conservatism in the flood mapping levels. Um, uh, so typically, if you're going to have a large flood and, and properties are going to be inundated, they're ones that were built quite some time ago. Yeah. Like Lismore, for example, yeah. um, when it floods, it's all the old places that yeah. go under. It's not the new places yeah. because... As times um, gone by, people have, you know, learned from those experiences and lifted it up and and done modelling and that type of thing. So, um, yeah, it's it's um, it's a constantly evolving sort of thing. To what extent the insurance companies use that information, I, I really don't know. Um, I was at a site the other day where um, uh, in an established suburban area. Um, in early waters, uh, new development um, had been constructed, and it was at least the floor level was at least a meter above the surrounding houses, and it was up on piers. That's because what that's what the flood level required it to be. Um, the floor level has to be 300 millimeters above the flood level. Um, but you know, here we are standing on this balcony of this dwelling, looking at all the other ones, thinking, "Gee, if there is some." Truth to this, we might be uh, okay, but there's a lot of that whole areas going under, you know. I and mean, this guy's having a barbecue on this deck, you know. I mean, like it's, uh, it was quite a dramatic uh, contrast. Yeah. Well, if areas is, are out of the picture because of flooding or in, or environmental reasons, um, how do you suggest that the housing supply? will be able to um, be increased to meet the demand on the coast? Um, well, I guess uh, when you look at documents like the South East Queensland Regional Plan, they've got a, this is produced by the Queensland Government last year, a really heavy bias towards apartment buildings. So it's saying that, um, that there's going to be 100,000 apartments built in this city between 2021 and 2046 that are nine storeys or more in height. Um, that's a lot. That's out of a total of 163,000 dwellings over that same period. So from the past, 100,000. 100,000 
apartments in buildings that are nine stories or more. Out of out of out, out of a six and sixty three. So uh, the problem with that is that uh, apartments are inherently expensive to build. Um, way more expensive than what I call slab on ground housing. Dwelling houses, duplexes, townhouses, those types of things that are typically one, two, three storeys high. So when you're building apartment buildings, you're uh, potentially, well, you're talking about concrete, you're talking about steel, you're talking about specialist labour, you're talking about unionised labour. Um, they're expensive to build. And um, if you look at all of the cranes building things in the city at the mm-hmm. moment, they're building apartments that are very expensive. None of that stuff is affordable. Mm. So the dilemma I see is that um, we've got a policy framework that's saying we're all going to be living in apartment buildings, yet only a certain proportion of society is going to be able to afford to do that. So where's everyone else going to live? Um, they have to live in slab on ground type housing um, in suburban locations because that's all they can afford to, to live in. Um, and we either provide that or they'll hunt it out. And they'll hunt it out in um, Bo Desert, Yarra Bilga, Ipswich, wherever. And uh, then the government will be spending huge amounts of money on transport infrastructure to get those people to here where the jobs are. Or, alternately, they can't live here and a whole range of jobs in society will go unfulfilled. So they might be teachers, they might be police officers. Aged care. Aged care workers, um, baristas. Yep. Um, you know, guys who fix your cars. Yeah. Oh, you, you name it. And uh, so you might be uh, comfortably living um, a, 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 in a very wealthy city and be very wealthy yourself, but a whole range of services won't be available to you because no one can actually perform them because they can't afford to live here. So these are the these are the big picture. Yeah, I'm sorry, I've got to deal with. I remember looking at my family up at this. My mother lives. You listen, yeah, those carers are coming and deal with. Yeah, and who who always until two or three years ago always lived locally, so they've been completely forced out. Mm. Byron Bay is the same. Everyone lives in Ballina, you know, and so they've got to do a I don't know, forty-five minute commute to get to to work. So um, so this is going to cost government's a lot of money in transport infrastructure getting those people safely to and from work um you know uh, and it's not a particularly healthy thing to be doing anyway no. really to be spending that amount of time driving to and from work you know, and i have driven out to bow desert lately but that's i wouldn't say that's a particularly safe road mm. you had twice as much traffic on it that's not a good outcome how about a less attractive well, I was a very basic apartment buildings. How come no? Do you think no one wants to pump those out? Ah, uh, there's no money in it. Basically, um, it's it's almost impossible to do that affordably. Um, what about build to rent? Uh, well, build to rent can usually only be undertaken by big entities. Yeah. You know, superannuation funds. Can uh, yeah. yeah. who? I guess they've got a large amount of money that they would normally invest in buying a shopping centre or an industrial complex or whatever. Uh, but instead, they might build 100 units because of the, the, the rent. But there's a misapprehension that built to rent means affordable. It doesn't. Because anyone um, investing in build to rent is doing so because the rents are expensive. And they're not, they're not in the business of uh, providing cheaper rents. Um, it's a business model. They're, they're just expanding the rental supply. And by expanding the rental supply, that might moderate, moderate the rents that people pay, but um, it's not affordable housing at all. Um, it's just a different form of housing. Yeah, but I guess if, if we... It costs a certain um, amount per square metre to build apartment buildings, and, and it doesn't matter that much where that's located... Um, so the land might be more expensive in Mermaid Beach, for example, as it is in Coomera, but all the other ingredients to building apartment buildings are ballpark about the same. So um, they're only really going to um, happen in more, for, more expensive, exclusive areas where they can be sold for a higher yeah. price. You know, you can't, 
We just really expect to build those in Kermara, for example, in an area that doesn't have great amenity, views, water, that type of thing, um, because you just won't get the prices. To so the stock coming on the market is not going to dramatically improve the, the, the addressing of the people that indeed affordable housing, because other social housing is different, because I think that's you know, it's a government responsibility, but if affordable housing, um, particularly over the Gold Coast, because like you said, you know, all the cranes are literally up and down here in terms of old, the old stuff being knocked down and the new stuff being built, no. which is going to be a, you, know, you need a quint to buy in. I'd be surprised if there's any new apartments being sold in the city for less than one, one point one, one point two million dollars these days, I would imagine. Because yeah. that's what it costs. My, I was in an Uber the other day and my, my Uber driver um, showed me a video of his new apartment that he just moved into on the Gold Coast, so, somewhere around Main Beach. Um, he said that it cost him $3 million on the plan. He must drive Uber for fun. But um, he now he said that once they've moved in, um, it's apartments in the, the same apartment in the building are uh, selling for over four. Yeah, yep, but pretty common sort of story. The numbers might be different in different circumstances, but it's all more. Um, yeah, so I guess it gets back to that point that you know, constructing, putting all your eggs in one basket and saying, right, oh, we're just going to build apartment buildings in the city is really not the answer mm-hmm. because. It can't cater for, you know, the vast majority of people in the community who simply can't afford that type of real estate. So it's just saying to suggest that we can. Um, I mean, the only possible circuit breaker might be that if the if the cost per square metre stays the same, and it's unlikely to reduce because we've got labour supply problems and things cost what they cost, they rarely come down then maybe people are going to get less unit for their money in the, in the future, i.e. the units are smaller. You know, they might be two-bedroom units or one-bedroom units even um, in, in good areas where you're, you're still going to pay a lot of money, but it's going to be less money because it's smaller. Causation in Brisbane is around the valley and you said you found all that sort of stuff is change the planning requirements and, and take out the need for um, care houses. Which is, which is just going to, you know, okay, it makes the build easier, but it's just the car is just going to be on the street. <laughs> yeah. But it's, but it, but it's, I know, it's an expe- it's, it is an expensive part mm. of, of, of a unit, but it's remotely yeah. usually one car spot for a two-bedroom unit. Yeah, well, um, the sort of contradiction at the moment is that you know, a lot of people look at these new apartment buildings and go, you know, they're... Under, under supplying car parking in that there's going to be a lot of parking on the street but most units being built now are luxury units they're three bedroom uh, size they have two spaces each which is more than what the planning scheme requires the reason is is because that's what the market wants if you can afford to buy a unit for, for the price you're asking for then you've pretty much got two cars and you, you expect to be able to park them so um, removing the need for car parking, I think in Brisbane they've recently introduced, I read something the other day about a maximum car park number. So in other words, rather than a minimum, they say you cannot provide more than this number of cars. Um, that will be interesting to see how that works because my understanding is that the valuers who work for the banks decide what your unit, unit is worth um, and one of the considerations is does it have car space absolutely and if it doesn't have one then it's worth a lot less and uh and then that whole financial equation might not work for that particular i like i live at kelvin grove and in yeah, my unit it is just a two-bedroom unit one car spot but also on our body corporate the, the, the absolute biggest issue with body corporate is is tenants continually using the business car spot for overflow, you know, so mm. and then they're told they can go on the street, but they really can't. Mm. It's because there's a little bit of permit permit spots. Yep. Um it's it's like it's like a breaking up of a social social cohesion over over cast up of 
have a community living at a car, at a car spot. It's, mm. like, it's it's this, and I, was, I make the point all the time to the people who are going to be able just just to understand that this is going to continue. Mm. It, you, you're going to have pressure to have less car spots in 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 buildings, and probably there's people are going to live together more. Mm. You know, so two bedroom units mm. may well house two couples. Yeah. That could be four. You know, I'm talking about single people. That could be four couples. Chance uh, they might have two or three cars between. Mm. Well, there's a flip side of affordability, I guess. I mean, um, if they want more car parking, then they're going to pay more for the unit or their rent's going to be higher. So, a bit of a balancing act, I guess. Um, you know, to some extent, the, if the affordability equation says that, you know, uh, there's only one car space that, that we have to fight over, then, you know, you're paying less rent or less lesser entry price. Um, this is what doesn't make sense in Brisbane anyway. That you built you know, the yeah the transport hubs. That, mm. that to me makes sense. Is you could you could build new apartments with limited car spots. Yeah. If 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 and the tenants could buy or the owners could buy that. And full knowledge is that there's mm. there's a there's an express bus lane there or a you know, like a tram side or something like that or whatever it is. You know what I mean? It's like mm. that that to me is sensible. Yeah. But if you but out of the Gold Coast, so I, I think the point to make is. What a twelve-story floppy units up at Cooma or somewhere like that. It, it, people are going to have to get in a car to drive. Yeah, good luck getting around without a car. Yeah. I guess it's just a factor of how big the city is too. I mean, I'm, as far as I know, if you go to Melbourne or Sydney, there are units that people build that don't have any cars, and that's accepted by the banks and the valuers and the the, the market. Um, but uh, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, we're a fair way off it. I would have thought so in the era period um yeah we we need to provide car space car spaces in the units yeah apartments that's going to cost money and make them affect their affordability um but it's and, until we mature into a bigger city with a better public transport system that's pretty much the way it's going to be well there's been stories where people have sold their property um bought something off the plan They've been told it's going to be 18 months completion or whatever, and it's not ready. And they're actually wealthy homeless people, you know, driving around Australia in camper vans waiting for whatever it is to be finished.